Let's talk about lifetimes. This graph shows my understanding of lifetimes over time. Like pretty much everyone else, in the beginning I struggled quite a bit. Eventually though, I reached a level where I was fairly comfortable using lifetimes. But they always remained somewhat mysterious to me. I never really had a solid mental model that allowed me to think of them and write code without needing help from the compiler. But all that changed when I started looking into how the borrow checker worked internally. Because I learned that there are actually two different ways you can think about lifetimes. A bit like how you can think of an electron as both a particle and a wave. And sticking with this analogy from physics, the problem is that the official Rust learning resources only tell you about the particle interpretation, leaving out half the picture. So my goal in this video is to introduce you to the world of lifetime waves. Well okay, this analogy is kind of falling apart. In any case, I want to introduce you to this other way of thinking that I personally find much more intuitive. But we'll start with a classic interpretation and an example from the Rust book. So you may have seen this code before. We create a reference to the variable x in an inner scope, store that reference in the variable r, and try to use that in the outer scope to print the value of x. This of course is not valid code, and the borrow checker will happily complain that x does not live long enough. So far, so good. The Rust book then goes on and tries to explain this error using the lifetimes of the variables x and r. The idea is that r clearly lives longer than x, and because r points to x, this is invalid code. There's just one problem with this explanation. If we remove the call to print, this code is now valid, even though r still points to x in the outer scope. However, because r is not actually used there, this is not an issue. The problem is, if we look at the lifetimes of the variables again, these haven't actually changed. r still lives longer than x, so what's wrong? Well, what's shown here aren't actually lifetimes. These are scopes, parts of the code where certain variables can be accessed. A lifetime is something else. The Rustonomicon defines them as named regions of code that a reference must be valid for. Okay, let's unpack that. These scopes are indeed named regions of code. That part is fine. However, they don't specify where references must be valid. First of all, x is not a reference at all. Therefore, it doesn't have a lifetime. And second, even though r is a reference, the region of code tick r does not actually specify where the reference r must be valid. Intuitively, that wouldn't make any sense, because up here, r isn't even initialized, so r's lifetime cannot start before this assignment down here. And then after the print, we don't actually need r to be valid anymore, because it's not used there. So in fact, this is what r's lifetime actually looks like. But if there's only one lifetime in this example, then why is there an error at all? Well, that's because r's lifetime crosses the closing curly brace of the inner block where x goes out of scope. And because r points to x, that is not allowed. If we now remove the print again, then r's lifetime collapses, because r isn't used anymore. And because its lifetime now no longer crosses the closing curly brace, this code is now valid. Alright, now we have a rough understanding of what lifetimes are. They're regions of code that certain references must be valid for. Makes sense, right? Well, let's say we come across a struct definition that uses two lifetimes. This is a bit weird, isn't it? We're looking at a definition of a data structure, but it uses lifetimes, which are regions of code. So if we want to understand what this definition actually means, do we now have to think about regions of code? Well, to me that never made too much sense. And we'll get to how I think of definitions like this now, later on in the video. First, let's have a look at another example which we'll use to introduce this other way of thinking about lifetimes. This example is similar to the previous one. Again, we create a reference to x in the inner scope and assign that to r. Only this time we print the value inside the inner scope. Then afterwards, in the outer scope, we reassign r to point to foo, which is declared at the start of the function. And again, we print what r points to at the end. However, this time the code is valid, even though r is the reference in the outer scope, and that's of course because it was reassigned to point to foo before the read. Now let's have a look at the lifetimes again. Here we can see that r's lifetime is now split. And that's because lifetimes are computed using a concept known as liveness. Liveness is fairly simple. A variable is live if its current value may be used later in the program. So going back to the example, we can see that this use of r in the inner scope is the last use of r before the reassignment in the outer scope. Meaning on these two lines in between, r is not actually live, which is why its lifetime has a hole here. But this picture is actually not complete, because we don't just need to know where r needs to be valid, we also need to know what r can point to. And we've actually used this information implicitly before. Let's remove the reassignment of r. Now we have something resembling the first example, 
And if you recall, we said that this was invalid because R's lifetime crossed the closing curly brace where X went out of scope. But that's of course only an issue because R points to X. If it pointed to foo instead, this code would just be valid. But let's undo all of those changes. Instead, let's make the reassignment of R conditional. Now the lifetime of R is no longer split, because if the branch was not executed, R still points to X. But if it was executed, R now points to foo. And the fact that R may point to either X or foo is represented by this set notation over here. So now you can see, references actually have two properties we care about. The first is when they must be valid, as in which regions of the code, and second, what they can point to. And this second property, what a reference can point to, is what we'll explore in the rest of this video. You see, a reference really is just a special kind of pointer. Special because it has this take a thing that the compiler uses to validate that the reference never points to invalid memory. And usually we think of take a as the reference's lifetime, as in which regions of the code the reference needs to be valid in. But as we've just seen, that's only half of the equation. So what if instead of thinking about take a as when the reference needs to be valid, we thought of it as what the reference can point to, as in which region of memory. Let's illustrate this idea with an example. Here's the function longest, which just returns the longest one of two strings. Now let's think of this take a as some region of memory. Note that it doesn't necessarily have to be contiguous. What this function signature is saying is that the function takes two strings that both live somewhere in this region of memory take a, and the function returns some reference into the same region. While this example is fairly simple, just being able to visualize lifetimes using a familiar concept, namely memory, without having to think about code or time, is why the region model is so useful to me. Now let's see what using this function looks like. Here we have three variables x, y, and z, pointing to the strings hi, hello, and hey. Below we compute the longest one of those strings. Now all of these variables are references, so they all have a region, or lifetime. Next, let's visualize these regions. So x, y, and z each have their own independent region containing their string. Let's ignore the rest of memory and focus only on these regions. Okay, now let's figure out what tick l1 is. The variable l1 is initialized with the result of a call to longest with x and y. Looking at the definition of longest, it may at first seem like all references involved need to have the same region, because in the signature they all use tick a. And this would mean that we'd have to unify the regions of memory tick x and tick y making them no longer independent. However, if it worked this way, references would be really annoying to use. Because if you think about tick x and tick y as lifetimes for a moment, this would mean that the strings hi and hello would have to have the same lifetime. In this case, since we're using string literals here, which all have the static lifetime, that would be fine. But let's say hello was allocated on the heap instead. Now we simply wouldn't be able to call longest with x and y, because their values have different lifetimes. The string literal lives for tick static, but the own string only lives until the end of the scope. And this problem is what subtyping and variants are about. But that's a topic for another video. For now, all you need to know is that this call to longest actually creates a new region tick a, and in this case, that needs to be the smallest region, such that both inputs of the function are contained within it. So in this case, tick a includes tick x and tick y. Now, since the result is assigned to l1, let's call this resulting region tick l1. And similarly for the second call, a new region is created, this time it must include the new tick l1 and tick z. And let's call this one tick l2. So this is what the lifetimes in this example look like when interpreting them as regions of memory. Alright, next let's talk about outlives, what it means and how you can think about it. In Rust, we can require one lifetime to outlive another one. It's not super common that you have to use this feature explicitly, like in this example, but implicitly you do actually use it pretty much all the time, perhaps without even realizing. In the last section we talked about how, at first, the signature of the function longest seemed as though all references involved had to have the exact same lifetime. And we talked about how, if it worked this way, that would be pretty annoying. But for the next example, let's pretend this was actually how lifetimes worked. Two references using the same lifetime parameter need to have the exact same lifetime. And our goal is now to change the function longest to still allow the user to pass in strings with different lifetimes. To achieve this, we have to use multiple lifetime parameters, one for each input and one for the output. However, making this change breaks the code, because the references we're trying to return are now unrelated to the output lifetime. But we can fix this by adding outlives constraints. The question is just, which ones do we need? 
While the compiler error you'd get for this code would actually just tell you which ones you need, we're of course trying to understand lifetimes and arrive at the solution ourselves. And to do that, we need to understand what outlives actually means. And to do that, let's switch back to thinking about lifetimes as regions of memory. So here we have our input and output regions. Currently, they're unrelated. What we now have to tell the compiler is that both input regions need to be contained in the output region, so that we can return either of the input references. Now if we think of these regions as sets, that means we need two constraints. tick s1 is a subset of tick out, and tick s2 is also a subset of tick out. Just simple set theory. Now, it just so happens that the outlives constraint in the region-based model is actually just a subset constraint. That's what it means. So these two constraints here are exactly what we need in the WHERE clause to make our code compile. So in summary, if you come across an outlives constraint, you can just think of that as a subset constraint. In my mind, I read constraints like this as tick A in tick B. And you can of course also think in terms of lifetimes and which of them need to outlive other ones, but to me at least, the regions and subsets are a more direct way of thinking about references. Oh, and the reason I said you're actually using outlives pretty much all the time implicitly is because the longest function, as is written here, is basically how the longest function with a single lifetime works under the hood in real Rust, thanks to subtyping and variants. All right, we have two more things to cover, but I'll keep those fairly short. So what do lifetime parameters and structs mean? Well, we can just think of those as regions of memory that references in the struct can point into. So that's not too advanced. What's more interesting are the kinds of errors you can run into when using lifetimes and structs, and how to avoid those by using multiple lifetimes. And I'll talk more about that in the next video about borrow checking, but don't expect that too soon. And the last thing is tick static, a static lifetime, which you can kind of think of as the data section of the executable. Although that's not fully accurate because it also includes leaked allocations. But that's gonna be it for this video. Hope you learned something, and if you did, do let me know down in the comments. I'd be curious whether this idea resonates with anyone. Oh, and I've also linked the article that originally inspired this video down in the description. If you read it, you may notice that they actually define lifetimes as sets of borrows, not regions of memory, but in my opinion, regions of memory are easier to think about and a good enough approximation in most cases. All right, that's it.